Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. This last session, I'd like to just say a few words. First of all, Rifka and I are, are very grateful for the invitation that we received to come to, to Dublin. I guess we're not technically in Dublin, we're in Powers Court. But it all came about because of primarily one family. A family who worked very hard to, to put this conference together, and unfortunately, none are with us right now, and most of you know the reason, and that is because Liz is, is in the hospital, very sick, and I want to thank those who, who picked up what, what they could not do. I want to thank them for, for doing that very much. Many people, Peter and Noel and many other, their wives and such, that that uh, labored and took time to, to make sure that this conference would, would go forth because Liz insisted that the conference would go forth. So before we begin this fourth session, I think it's very appropriate that we would just take a moment and uh, pray. So let's do that. Now, I don't know about your tradition. Our tradition is just like yours pretty much. We sit there. But in much of Eastern Europe, whenever there's prayer, they stand. And i kind of just been impressed. Wow, that's a, a nice tradition. So if we could, let's all rise up. Honor God as we come before him. Our Lord, our God, God of our fathers, God of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Lord, we praise you because no matter what, we have a holy God, a God who is righteous, a God who is merciful and gracious, a God who has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. A God who is acquainted with death as you send your only begotten son into this world to die a, a horrible, a suffering death, death even on a cross. So Lord, you know all things and we trust you that your will is perfect. We pray for your perspective to be our perspective. That we might see things not through our own eyes, but we acknowledge our, our need, our absolute dependence upon your revelation. Not only the revelation of Scripture, but for you to guide us, direct us, illuminate, show forth to us your, your purposes and your plans and Lord, we, we come before you now, lifting up Liz and John and Abigail as each of them suffer. And we pray, Lord, that you would, would be that, that stronghold, that you would give them not only strength, but also, also that, that comfort, that peace that only you can give. I thank you personally for the testimony that I've heard from Liz about this, this battle and her confidence, not in a physical outcome one way or another, but your eternal outcome for her and all people who trust in you, who have entered into this, this covenant of eternal life. So we do pray for healing. We, we seek a miracle. We seek your judgment upon that disease. And Lord, we know that you are able. But we also know that, that there are some that are healed and others that are not. And Lord, we don't understand all the reasons. But Lord, we are not like pagans who latch on to an idol and worship that idol. As long as we think that that idol will give to us what we want. And when we don't receive it, we smash it. No, God, we sanctify your name. 
in victory and even in this earthly times of defeat. We know that in the end, we will be more than overcomers. And that we will have that ultimate victory, each of us, of being with you in that house, that kingdom, where we will worship you and love you and understand all of your ways. So, Father, we affirm our faith and we testify of the faith of this family that loves you and turns to you and seeks your power and your deliverance. All these things we lift up to you in the blessed name of our Lord and our Savior, who is indeed that that great physician. We say yes to your will in the name of Messiah Yeshua. Amen. You may be seated. I do like questions, and one I receive that will begin with is this question concerning a very important event. I uh, purposely kind of skipped over it in our first session, but the question had to do with what's called the Shikutz HaMeshomem, which is the abomination of desolation. Now, it's mentioned in the book of Daniel, in fact, twice in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, and in actuality, it's mentioned again in chapter 11 and a third time in Daniel chapter 12. And when we look into the New Testament, we see we have a group that are studying, going through a great gospel, the gospel of Mark. And they're in chapter 13. If you know Mark's gospel in chapter 13, it's that parallel passage from Matthew 24 that deals with the end times. And let me just simply say that when we look at that passage, what's commonly referred to as the Olivet Discourse, why? Because Messiah shared these words while he was on the Mount of Olives. And we know why. He talked about the last days, about the kingdom when he was sitting on the Mount of of olives. And in that passage, he begins to speak. And here again, grammar is important. And we sometimes get bored by that. We may not understand the grammar that we were taught in elementary school. But when you look at the scripture, grammar forms a strong foundation for rightly interpreting God's word. And you recall that Messiah, he Eventually went on that Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him and says, you know, tell us about these things. Meaning, he spoke about the destruction of the temple, did he not? About how one stone will not be left upon another. So they were interested in that. And they said, tell us about these things. And also, your coming and the end. Now this is important. Because there's a false philosophy or theology going on today that looks at, for example, the book of Revelation says, oh, it's all about the past. There's nothing to do with the future in the book of Revelation. Now, I don't know how one comes to that with looking and reading the scripture, but they'll say, well, didn't Messiah speak in that passage about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD? Yes, he did. But why? And here's the answer. What he said 40 years earlier, did it not come true? I mean, I was in Jerusalem last week. And I could go and see, and was with a group that we did that, to saw the stones that had been cast down from the temple area. You can see them. You can see the impact on the road of these big boulders and what they did. It's there, visible today. What he spoke was true. But don't reach the wrong conclusions. It all has to do with 70 AD. And we can interpret it as an allegory. We can spiritualize it. We can just overinterpret it and say it's all in the past. No. His message was this. In the same way that I personally, Messiah, personally spoke about the destruction. Was he right? Yes, he was. And that is to show that equally he's going to be right when we deal with what? 
these last days. He was proven true 70 AD. He's going to be proven true in the last days. So the disciples come. They want to know about these things. And the word that's so important is the word end. In fact, you read it several times in verses 3 through 15. We have that word end. Now, I don't mind with people disagreeing, debating. I like to argue. My wife can attest to you that. <laughs> and it doesn't bother when someone says, I disagree with you. Well, why do you disagree? And we go through, that's how I've learned a lot from people who disagree with me. Many times they're right, I'm wrong. But what I would say to anyone is, what end is he talking about? Well, in verse, 20, verse 14 of Matthew 24, he says, And then the kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom, has to be proclaimed throughout all the world, right? Matthew 24, verse 14. And then the gospel of this kingdom will be proclaimed throughout all the earth as a testimony, and then the end will come. Here again, what end are we talking about? Well, to help us understand that, when you look at the next verse, verse 15, he speaks about what this gentleman asked, Mr. Murphy. And that was, that was about the abomination of desolation. You look at verse 15, it says, And when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, that the reader understand. Now, what's he speaking about? Well, tie these two verses together. The end and the abomination of desolation. We know something. The abomination of desolation happens in the middle point. At three and a half years. And when we look at Matthew 24, beginning with verse 3, all the way through verse 14, when Yeshua speaks, he says, you... You, you, who's he speaking to? His disciples. Now, if he's speaking about the last days, yes, he's speaking about those 12 disciples in regard to the last days, but what he says has to do with disciples in the last days. That means, perhaps, you and me. And he says there's going to be those birth pains. He says there's going to be persecution. There's going to be these earthquakes and famines and such. And then he says, the gospel's got to go forth. Then the end is going to come. And when he speaks about that end, he points to the abomination of desolation. After that, from verses 16 through verses 31, he doesn't speak about you, 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 meaning the disciples. He's speaking to and about Israel. He says in verse 16, let those who are in Judea, and there's going to be a great time of tribulation that the world has not seen. He's speaking about Daniel chapter 12, and this tribulation is to Israel, that they're going to go through a time of suffering. But what I wanted to speak to is what is, based upon this question, what is the abomination of desolation? And one of the best places to look, as I said, Daniel 9, Daniel 11, Daniel 12 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We know what it is. It is when the Antichrist will go into the Holy of Holies. Why? He's an Antichrist. He is a false representation of Christ. Remember, we see that in Revelation 13. About this, this one who's like a lamb, but he's really what? A dragon. And he's going to want to do the things that Messiah is supposed to do. We know that Messiah, we talked about in our previous session, he is going to come to the Mount of Olives, come down, go over the Kidron Valley, enter in through the Eastern Gate into the Holy of Holies, right? Well, the Antichrist is going to do that previously. He's going to go into the Holy of Holies and say, and Paul teaches this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verses 3, 4, and 5. He says that the Antichrist is going to go in, and he's going, and he's quoting Daniel chapter 11, by the way. Check it out. He is going to exalt himself 
and take a stand against everything that is holy or godly. And he's going to proclaim himself to be God. And where is he going to do that? Well, if you look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's going to do that. Many of your Bibles will say in the temple, right? But if you're looking, it's not the normal word for temple. The Greek word for temple is hileron. Comes from the same root as the word for priest in the Greek language. But it's not the word hileron. It's the word neos. Why is that important? Neos is the sanctuary. It goes along with what we find prophetically. And Paul wouldn't have made this mistake. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit. He purposely chose the word neos to tell the reader, it's not just in the temple, but specifically in the Holy of Holies. What is he about? He is about exalting himself above all that is called godly. He is prideful. And he's known as the son of destruction because pride leads to destruction. So the abomination of desolation requires that there be a temple, and there's going to be a temple. Now, the temple that we're speaking about for the abomination of desolation, see, you need to understand something. Many people are like, no way would Islam allow for there to be a temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem next to that Dome of the Rock. Well, who wants there to be a temple there? The Antichrist. He's going to be ruling over the world. We've already talked about he's going to do many seemingly good things for the Jewish people. He's going to act like he loves them. He is going to build them a temple. He is going to give them peace and security. But watch out. When the scripture says that there's going to be someone that proclaims peace and safety, what happens? Sudden destruction is coming. So he's going to want this temple to be built. It is not going to be a temple that honors God. It is not going to be a temple. Yes, there will be sacrifices. We're not talking about those sacrifices in the millennial kingdom. The sacrifices that will take place prior to the millennial kingdom in that temple will be done not in a way that's pleasing or acceptable to God. And it's going to be the Antichrist. And realize something about him. The nature, we were talking at one of the breaks about the harlot. Remember, there's that beast and there's a woman that sits on, right? A harlot that sits on the beast. Now, harlotry prophetically is usually not speaking about sexual immorality, but usually prophetically harlotry is speaking about spiritual infidelity or idolatry. And the character initially, and don't miss this, the character of that empire in the last day initially is going to be idolatrous, meaning this, religious pluralism, which means you can worship any way you want. Anyway, and it's acceptable, and all religions are jointly equal. And if you think yours is better, that's a no-no. You have to affirm now, I have no problem saying people have rights to worship how they want to worship. Obviously limited. But they have that right. But I should still have right to say, you know, your faith, what you believe, based upon my book, it's falsehood. Now, he can say that same thing to me. I don't have a problem with that. But during the time of the Antichrist, well, it's coming right now, you can't say that. If you say something like that, you're going to be called a religious bigot. Get ready for that. That's okay. People have the right to call you whatever they want to call you, right? That's okay. Don't let that intimidate you. Oh, I don't want to be called a bigot. You're going to be called a bigot. Okay, realize that. You're going to be called narrow-minded, exclusive, offensive, dangerous. Because we believe that Yeshua is the only way into the kingdom. He is the only Savior. He is the only Son of God. But what's going to be popular is for people to say, well, Muhammad was the Son of God, Buddha was the Son of God, all this, that is an abomination to God. So we're going to take that stand 
and we're going to be hated for it. Get ready for that. So the abomination of desolation, the world's going to be embracing this religious pluralism, and so is this, this empire in the last days. But realize, it says something, that some of the kings are going to go to war against that harlot, right? Read the book of Revelation carefully and destroy that harlot. What's it speaking about? It is not going to be the religion ultimately of the Antichrist. That kingdom, this false kingdom, that kingdom, the goat that we spoke about, it's going to rise up. And not immediately is the Antichrist going to be the leader of it. He is going to come and take his position and realize something. Eventually, and it's the abomination of desolation, he is going to say, no, no, no. No more idolatry. No more worshiping who you want to worship. He's going to tell Israel, nope, you've got to accept me as your God. Israel's going to reject that. We talked about it. That's going to give rise to Jacob's trouble, Jacob's trial. And anyone who will not bow to him and agree that he's God, the Antichrist, he is going to destroy. That's the whole thing of the mark of the beast. All of this. He's got to be worshipped. Why? He wants to be the only God. That's why he's apart or in, in opposition against the one true God. And he knows that if he can get Israel on his side, as I said earlier, he's going to win. But when Israel rejects, he's going to come and want to destroy Israel completely. The, the sealing of Israel, just want to remind you, I mentioned it briefly this morning, that sealing of Israel in Revelation chapter 7 is from the wrath of God that's falling, not from the persecution of the Antichrist. Many, what does it say? Two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to be put to death. It's going to be worse than the Holocaust. So that's the abomination of desolation. And we see that spirit of the abomination of desolation taking all over various countries in the world. And my opinion is Europe, sorry for saying this, but I'm going to be honest, Europe in many ways is leading the world in such a view. All right, let's go to our final passage the book of Revelation, and we're going to conclude Revelation chapter 20. We left off in verse 11. We're going to conclude in the next 30 minutes these five verses. And we've seen the Antichrist, or excuse me, the false Messiah, the false, Satan himself, being bound, right, that dragon of old, being released, going to war, and now put back where? Where is Satan now? At the, he, he, he's not only bound, he is in the lake of fire and brimstone. Now, remember, he's leading the way into that lake. Now, understand that hell is not eternal. Many times I receive the question, do you believe in a literal hell? Yes, I do. But hell is not forever. But the lake that burns with fire and brimstone is. So hell, well, it's bad. The lake of fire and brimstone is worse. So it's not like I'm saying hell ends one day. You know, there's a growing theology in among Christianity that believes that eventually a person just dies and it's no more. That there's not ongoing. But that's not what the scripture says, is it? Day and night, forever and ever. That's what we see in the scripture. Look at verse 11. And I saw, John is still receiving revelation. I saw a great white throne. Here again. What's important in the book of Revelation? The throne. And I saw a great white throne. And the one who sit upon it. From whose face fled the earth and the heavens. And a place was no longer found for them. Now, what's being foreshadowed? Well, realize something. Remember Yeshua in Matthew chapter 5, that Sermon on the Mount? He was asked about the Torah. And he says, 
until heaven and earth pass away. Not one jot, not one tittle through pass away through of this word, right? He came not to abolish or destroy, but to fulfill. Now, fulfilling means do away with. It does not. There is still a relevance for the Torah. But when this millennial kingdom comes to an end, when what we talk about is over today, when we get into chapter 21, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. What's that called? The new Jerusalem. And in the new Jerusalem, there will be no Torah. There will be no need for it. Why? Because the new Jerusalem, this final state, the eternal state of the kingdom of God, everything's going to be what? Perfect. In the millennial kingdom, there will be sin. In the new Jerusalem, there will not be. It will be perfect. What does John say? He says, in looking at this vision of the new Jerusalem, he says, behold, all things are what? New. They're going to be new and perfected. Look again, verse 11. And I saw this great white throne, and the one, and that's the emphasis in the book of Revelation, the one who sat upon it, from whom's face fled the earth and the heaven. And a place was no longer found for them. It's all about this transition, this, this change that's coming into creation. And for that to happen, there has to be what? Judgment. Just remember that paradigm. And I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before God. So now we have a type of resurrection. The dead are now standing. That shouldn't surprise us. I mean, look sometime at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, it says, there's going to be a resurrection. And some are going to be resurrected to everlasting life and glory, right? And others are going to be everlasting, uh, everlasting death to shame and contempt. So now we're seeing here this resurrection for everlasting shame and contempt. Look again, verse 12. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the God. Does your Bible say that? The God. The definite articles there. And books were opened up. And a different book. Now, it's fine to say another book, but it's speaking about a book that's very different. It's not just another book but one that the Greek word here means not another of the same type, but one of a different type. So a different book was opened up, which is of the life. I like these definite articles. Not just speaking about life, but what? The life, a particular life. What type of life? Kingdom life. And we find... End of verse 12. And the dead were judged from the things written in the books. Now, books were open up. And what do these books contain? Well, it tells us. It contains according to their works. Work is not just what I did, but what I said and even what I what? Thought. So God, he put it down in writing. Everything that you thought that you ought not. Everything that you did. Every sin and every good thing too. All of them have been written down. Now, you all know the expression, seeing is believing. There's not going to be any argument. God's got it all written down. We're not going to say, oh, that's not. Yes. Now, by the way, the great white throne judgment it's not for us. We will not be at that great white throne judgment. It has nothing to do with believers. It is for who? The dead. Those who were not part of the millennial kingdom. Those who did not receive Messiah. So look again. And I saw the dead, both small and great, standing before God. Books were opened up 
and a different book were opened up, which is of the life. And the dead were judged out of the things written in the books according to their deeds. Now, realize something. Even though we're not here, deeds are also important to us. Why? In the same book of Revelation, he says, Behold, I'm coming soon to render to each man a reward according to what? His deeds. Now, it's not talking about salvation. When it comes to entering into the kingdom of God, your deeds are not relevant. They're not, they're not part of the equation. It's only one thing. Have you received this new covenant? Do you accept or have you accept the gospel? Now, let me give you a paradigm. Because I was talking to an individual this year, an Israeli, and we were speaking about the gospel. And he says, it is just so foolish. So foolish to believe that someone can be a horrible sinner. I said, like you? Right? We're all a horrible sinner. And because of a sacrifice, everything's forgiven and you're just ushered in to the kingdom of God. He says, I can't accept that. I said, I thought you were Jewish. I thought you were Orthodox. I thought that you believed the Torah. I said, don't you know anything about Passover? I said, in regard to Passover, did it matter who kept the Passover? Were there Gentiles that kept the Passover? Judaism says yes. The Bible says that's right. There was that mixed multitude that came out with the Hebrews. So there were Jewish people that kept, Jewish people that didn't. Gentile people that kept, Gentile people that did not. And when it came to this judgment passing over that house, did it matter who was in that house? This is a really bad guy. Or not. This guy, he did a lot of great things. Did God take that into consideration at all? What's the answer? No. Not relevant. The only thing that God looked at was one thing. Was there the blood of the lamb appropriated properly on that family? That's it. If there was blood there, he passed over. Didn't matter how sinful someone was, how many so-called good deeds they did, made no difference. The blood changed everything. I said, right? It's not so foolish, isn't it? It's the same message. It's just that you need to know who is the real Passover lamb. That's what it comes down to. Whose lamb and whose blood redeems? One is a paradigm. One is the real thing. But we're not talking about entering into the kingdom of God. We're talking about, well, I was, about the judgment of rewards. That has nothing to do with the gospel. It has to do with after you've received the gospel what you're going to receive. He's going to bless you for your acts of faithfulness that he did through you and that you did by means of the Holy Spirit. It's his ministry, but we get rewarded when we participate with him. Now let's go back to the text. We're talking about now entrance into the kingdom of God. All these people who weren't alive in the millennial kingdom, they were where? In hell. They are going to be resurrected out of hell they are going to stand before the one who sits upon this great white throne. Throne, Who is that? Messiah. Jesus. Exactly. Why do we know that? Paul tells us all matters of judgment have been given to who? The Son. Jesus. Now, I like that because he's also the advocate, which is another word for lawyer, the prosecuting attorney. He's also judge. Let me tell you. If you're the prosecutor, and you're also the judge, how many cases are you going to lose? <laughs> Nothing. Vice versa. If you're the defense attorney and you're the judge, how many cases are you going to learn, lose? None. That's the situation. That's the situation. It's all according to him. What do we read? The dead, they are going to be judged according to everything that was written in these books. Based upon what? Their deeds. And we find that C, they gave up the dead that were in them. And death and Hades, they gave up their death that was in them. And each one, now that's important, each one. 
Dan and Fran have been to Israel several times, correct? We were at dinner last night, and we were talking about our tour group, and he, in a good way, pridefully, right? I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. He said there was only one place, right? One place that we went that he had not been, and that was the synagogue at Mount Moron. I would have guessed that probably not too many of you have ever heard of Mount Moron. Now, it is much more tied to Judaism than it is anything to do with Christianity. That's why most groups don't go there. But I went there for one reason. Because what's famous about this, this Bet Midrash is not the place, but how to get there. It's mentioned in the rabbinical writings of, of ancient times, in the Gemara and the Mishnah in regard to judgment. It says, the judgment of God will be like the Shvil of Bethat Midrash Mirod, which means this. The judgment of God will be like the pathway that leads into this, this synagogue, we'll call it. Why is that? Well, I had everyone go, and it's very narrow. And you have to take it one by one. And that's what this scripture is saying. Everyone's going to be judged one by one. Look at it, verse 13 at the end. And each is going to be judged according to their works. And death and Hades, they're going to be cast into that, that lake that burns, right? Burns with, with fire. This is called what? The second death. Now, here's the message. People are going to come before God, Messiah Yeshua, and they are going to be judged by their works. And do works justify us? No. And therefore, they, each one of them, he's going to say, your works are inadequate. And they're going to say, is there any other way that I can get into the kingdom of heaven? And the answer is yes. How's that? What was also mentioned? Another book, right? The book of life. Elsewhere in the scripture, it's called the Lamb's book of life. Whenever you have that word lamb in the scripture, what should come into your mind? Redemption. Redemption through Messiah, Jesus, his blood. So there is a way. There's only one way through that blood of that lamb. If so, your name is written in that book of life. Look again at verse, verse 14. And the dead and Hades, they, they were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whomsoever is not found in the book of the life. Who's written? The order is different in, in Greek. Whomsoever is not written in the book of the life, they are cast into what? This lake of fire. So it all comes down with one thing. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? If it is, you're not going to experience that judgment. Messiah is going to welcome you into the kingdom of God. And we find here that the millennial kingdom, it ends with what? How would you classify what we've studied? Judgment. And immediately after this final judgment, what's going to happen? Look at chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and also the sea. Now, what I want you to realize here is that there's going to be a new creation. Biblically, biblically, when we talk about the kingdom, this final kingdom, the new Jerusalem, prophetically, we see language. Let me give an example. If you look some time at the book of Zechariah, believe in Zechariah chapter 12, you'll see about God doing something. God stretching out the heavens and establishing the earth. What does that sound like? 
creation. But he's not talking about that first creation. He's talking about the second creation, which is the establishment of the kingdom of God. And therefore, we see in Revelation 21, this new creation, a new heaven and a new earth, a new reality. And I'm going to close because I'm going to keep my word about a few questions and entering or finishing on time. I want to share with you a story that, that spoke to my heart and one that, that I think is insightful in regard to understanding the new Jerusalem. And that is, we know something. At the time of this blessed hope, when Messiah returns, not his second coming, but when he gathers up his people, before God's wrath falls, it says, in the twinkling of an eye, we are going to be changed. And when you look at this further about this event, it's not just in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is that famous chapter about resurrection. I think it's significant that the rapture is put in the context of resurrection. Resurrection, new life, eternal life. And we know that in that chapter, he speaks about bodies, right? He says, you know, fish have one type of body. Why? Because they dwell in the water. Birds have another because they fly in the sky. Animals have another because they live upon earth. they are celestial bodies like the moon and the stars and such. And they're also what? Heavenly bodies, which we can understand as kingdom bodies. All each of those bodies are perfectly designed for their habitation. Likewise, we're going to receive a kingdom body that's perfectly designed for the kingdom of God. You know what that's called? Biblical predestination. Now, why do I say it that way? Predestination, biblically, is not what John Calvin taught. Most of the time, we hear predestination, and we think about, well, if you believe in that, I believe in biblical predestination. What people will tell you, theologians, is predestination is God has predetermined Who's going to be in the kingdom of heaven and who's not, right? That's usually how it's taught. That's how, you don't find that in the scripture. You know what you find about predestination? First of all, predestination only involves those who are in Messiah. Did you realize that? Look at where it's found. Ephesians chapter 1, Romans chapter 8. Look at the scripture, what it says. See, we all too often form our theological beliefs about books from books that we read rather than Scripture. Go to what the Scripture says about predestination. Ephesians 1 is a great place. Begin reading in verse 3 or so and you'll see it. It only has to do with those who are in Christ. If you are not in Christ, predestination doesn't apply to you. What is predestination? He promises something. Predestination comes from the word orazo, which is to see. And it's pro-orazo, which is to see or to cut out like a pattern of a dress. Orao or orizo. They come from the same root. Verbs in Greek have omai or eo or izo as different innings. I know this is very interesting to you, but, but trust me, they do. But they have, they can have the same root, just a different verbal ending. Now, the word proorizo has to do, the best example is if you want to make a dress. You use a pattern, right? And you can know what that dress is going to look like because you've seen what? The pattern that's been cut out. Well, what we have, what is biblical predestination? If you are in Messiah, it's already been predetermined what you're going to be like. And what's that? Messiah. Now, you're not going to become God. You're not the son of God, but you are going to be like him in holiness and righteousness. You never become divine, but you reflect his glory. Isn't that good news? And it's already been predetermined. God has already made it a reality. The work, everything's been done. We're just waiting for the outcome. That's biblical predestination. Read Romans 8 at the end. Ephesians chapter 1. Has nothing to do with predestining who's going to be in heaven and who's not. 
You don't find that in the scripture. Now, why am I saying that? Because we who are part of this, this gathering up of that blessed hope prior to the wrath of God, we're going to receive that new body. This body of glory, this body that reflects the character of the kingdom. Okay? Those are those who took part in the rapture. What about those who came to faith after the rapture or in the millennial kingdom? There's no scripture, no scripture whatsoever that speaks about them having a glorified body. But they're going to live forever. How? Well, it tells us in the scripture. Now, if you do a study of these last two chapters of the book of Revelation, just read them quickly even. Would you not agree that there are similarities between that new Jerusalem, the kingdom in its final state, and, and the Garden of Eden? Right? There's similarities. In the Garden of Eden, there was a whole bunch of trees, right? But those aren't the important ones. Remember, there was those two trees, right? The, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Now, if you're wise, they would have ran to that tree of life, right? But they didn't. They went to what one? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> Praise God, that tree's not there. That tree's not there. But there's another tree that's supernaturally on both sides of the river. Do you understand that? How can there be one tree on both sides of the river? I don't care. It's going to be. God can do it. Now, to understand what he's going to say immediately thereafter, we have to go back to one of my favorite teachings of Messiah. Now, remember, he was... No, Yeshua never stayed in Jerusalem, did he? Never went to some prestigious priest. Some political leader. He didn't do that. Where did he go? Bethany. Bethany. House of the afflicted ones or house of poverty. He went to the, the, the cheapest place around Jerusalem. That's where he stayed. And one morning he was going back to the temple. It was in the morning. It says the scripture he was what? Hungry. Hungry. And he saw, what did he see? A fig tree. And he went there expecting there to be figs. But the scripture tells us it wasn't the season for figs. Did this passage ever bother you? Okay. I mean, who created the fig tree? He did. That's what Colossians 1 says. So he goes and says, I'm hungry. Let's go to the fig tree. I'm going to get some figs. But it's not the season for figs. I mean... Whenever there's stuff like that in the scripture, that's where the wisdom is. He's do, it's a teaching moment for the reader. He knows all things. And when he went there and didn't find figs, what did he do? He cursed that fig tree. Now, I share this. Dan and friends heard this hundreds of times. I apologize. But my, little, my littlest daughter, Tova, when I told her this story from the scripture, she began to cry. Why? She felt bad for who? The fig tree. The fig tree. She, it's, it's not fair. It's not the season. She was young, four or so. It's not the season for figs. Why would he do that? Okay. Who says it's not the season for figs? That is a worldly perspective from this world, right? Trees have seasons. That's not God's will. That is a consequence of sin. Now, understand, the fig tree. Remember, we talked about Matthew 24, and I mentioned verses 3 through 14. Then verse 15, the abomination of desolation. Then I said from verses 16 through 31, it deals with Israel in those days. What verse did I stop with? Verse what? 31. What's verse 32? Very good, the fig tree. He commands us, watch who? The fig tree. Who's the fig tree? Israel, exactly. You see what he's doing? He's coming to Israel. Understand the message of the gospel. He's coming to that fig tree. And the world says, 
It's not the season for fruit. Fruit, good works. That's a consequence of sin. In the kingdom of God, trees are going to bear fruit how frequently? Every, 12 times a year. Every month, there's going to be fruit. That's what we're supposed to do. See, when Messiah looked at that fig tree, he was not evaluating based upon the laws of nature. A law based upon the outcome of sin. He was looking at the fig tree, and by the way, this is how he looks not just of Israel, but everyone. He doesn't look at you, Mrs. Believer, Mr. Believer, and say, oh, you're just a sinner saved by grace, therefore don't expect much from me. That's how most people are. He says, you have been redeemed with my blood. All things are possible. He tells us that they should see our good works and what? And praise our Heavenly Father. He expects perfection, right? That's what the scripture says. Be ye perfect. Now, I fall far short of that. But don't change the expectation. Don't change the goal. He expects fruitful life. And he's given us his only spirit, his Holy Spirit, to enable us to do that. We don't have much in the way of excuse, do we? So he looks at this fig tree and he says, I'm not judging you by this world standards. I'm judging you by the kingdom truth. And you have no fruit, cursed. That should be some sober, sobering words. Now, I believe in eternal security. But nevertheless, those are sobering words. What's the message? In Revelation, those last two chapters, dealing with the new Jerusalem, it speaks about that tree. And it says it gives fruit all the time, every month. And its leaves are for what? Healing, Healing of the nations. Not for the church. The nations. We will be, in my opinion, forever and ever and ever in this status and condition of glory. This new body. Nothing's going to change that. But for those who did not take part in that blessed hope, they will live forever, but they are going to be dependent upon what? That, that tree, those leaves of the tree of what? Life. It's just to show, in my opinion, truly, how important it is to receive the gospel now and the eternal benefits from it. Everyone who's in the new Jerusalem, they will live forever. No one's going to be lost. But just remember what verse. The leaves are for the healing of the nations. Well, God has a marvelous plan. And that is his new Jerusalem. But let me remind you, it's going to be a bumpy way to get there. There's going to be a lot of hardship, trials, tribulation. But one thing I can promise you is this. If you accept Messiah Yeshua, you have faith in that blood that was shed upon that cross. You may be persecuted. I believe you will. You may suffer the facts of, of being in this fallen world. But you know what you'll never experience? you will never experience the wrath of God. No, instead of receiving the wrath of God, you ultimately are going to be in his kingdom, that new Jerusalem, whereby you are going to be a recipient eternally of his goodness, of his blessings, of his promises. And we are going to have all of eternity to worship God and will never, ever, ever be tired of doing so. There'll be no more death, no more sickness, no more problems. It will be perfection because that kingdom is going to reflect the identity of our Lord and Savior, our great God, Messiah, Jesus. Let's all rise. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to assemble here in Ireland, to open up your word, to look at your truth, and hopefully hear a few things that may drive us right back to the scripture. That we might know your word better and better. That it will impact our lives and others that you will lead us to minister to. God, we pray that you might use us. 
that you might change us, that we might see things from a kingdom perspective, knowing, knowing that that reality will change our today and tomorrow until you call us to be with you. So, Father God, we thank you for the truth of Scripture. And we pray that the foolishness of, of man doesn't corrupt it. No, we want to know your truth. So, Holy Spirit, be our teacher as we go into the, your word tonight, tomorrow, the rest of the week. You be the teacher. This we pray in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. I thank you for your attentiveness. It was a joy to be here. Peter, thank you for, I look at him so often, he's got a big smile always upon his face so I could learn from that. So anyway, Peter, thank you very much. You might want to come and just thank the other people who, who helped you. I don't know all their names and such, but I do want them to be recognized. You can be seated. Dan, thank you for operating the camera. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.